Gran Canaria contains everything that can be found on other islands too. Although not as breathtaking as those of Tenerife, the most sheltered valleys, the deepest volcanic grooves, and the most interesting natural peculiarities can be found here, wrote Jules Verne in his last book, Thompson Travel Agency, written in 1905. The Canary Islands live in people's minds as a place for mass tourism, where a string of hotels are lined up and sandy beaches alternate with pebbly ones. Of course, there are lots of hotels and beaches, but only those who visit this place personally can see for themselves that these islands offer so many other attractions, monuments and curiosities of cultural history, entertainment and shopping facilities, and above all, natural beauties. Let's have a look at Mogan Harbor, which has a uniform style with its snow-white houses surrounded by flowers, narrow lagoons, restaurants with patios, and cafes attracting tourists. Judging from the number of yachts in the bay, this is not all in vain. We can hire any kind of watercraft from paddle boats to luxurious yachts, and there are cruises as well, for example to observe dolphins in their natural habitat. And what could be more romantic than sailing at sunset and then having dinner by candlelight and champagne on the terrace of one of the restaurants in the port. The Canary Islands are also known as the Islands of Eternal Spring. In summer, the temperature is above 30 degrees Celsius. In winter, the temperature never falls below 18 degrees here. There's more rain in wintertime, but in August and September, people living on the islands struggle with drought. According to Thomas Whitmore's survey, of which local people are very proud, the inhabitants of Las Palmas and generally in Gran Canaria have the good fortune to live in the most pleasant climate of the world. Despite its name, Gran Canaria isn't the biggest one of the group of islands. It's only the third, after Tenerife and Fuerteventura. 
Though Las Palmas is the biggest city with a population of 400,000, it alternates as capital of the Canary Islands with Santa Cruz de Tenerife. The Canary Islands lie in the vicinity of the Azores and the Green Cape Islands, slightly more than 100 kilometers from the African coastline in the Atlantic Ocean. This area was called Over the Pillars of Hercules in ancient times. This meant that the Strait of Gibraltar of today and everything that is above it doesn't belong to the known world. Would the lack of specific knowledge and the ambiguous reports of the travelers have been supplemented by poetic license? Might the island of the happy, or the Elysian fields, or the garden of the Hesperides be the state we call Atlantis today? If so, did this empire exist? If it did, should we look for it here? Despite the incredible amounts of research results published so far, there are more questions today than answers. The evidence that could mean a real breakthrough is missing. But should we be surprised about this? According to legend, the island was buried by lava during an eruption, then it sank to a depth of 1,000 meters due to an earthquake. Only the highest mountains can be seen rising out of the ocean. They're the Azor and Canary Islands today. If there's something to find, it's hidden somewhere in the deeps of the ocean around the islands. The natives of the islands were the Gouache, whose origin is not clear. They were tall, blonde European-type people with light eyes. They lived in caves, as can be seen at Galder or Zenobia de Valaron. They wore furs, they decorated their bodies with marks, painted geometrical patterns on the walls of their caves, and embalmed their dead. Several researchers think that they were survivors of Atlantis. The first description of the Guanche comes from Boccaccio. The adventurer Jean de Betancourt of Norman origin, who was a mercenary in Castilla, invaded the islands in 1402. The natives, according to the customs of the era, were converted to Christianity by force, and those who wouldn't adopt Christianity were slaughtered. Ninety-five years passed by the time the conquerors were able to defeat the last Guanches. Then the few remaining natives mixed with the mainly Portuguese and Spanish population. In Las Palmas, the Canary Museum can be found, where material of finds before the Spanish conquest are displayed. A huge brown rock provides the backdrop to God's finger, Dedo de Dios, a rock monolith rising towards the sky. It reminded superstitious fishermen of a warning index finger. An interesting manifestation of the religious heritage of the locals is the festival originating from the pagan Guanches. At the beginning of August, they flog the sea with branches of pine trees while praying for rain. The houses with blue Venetian blinds in Puerto de los Nevas remind us of Greek fishing harbors, only the building of the church and the carved wooden balconies remind us that we're on the Canary Islands. At Zenobia de Valoron, the network of caves, consisting of over 300 holes connected with corridors with dingy stairs, dates back to the times of the Guanche. From the evidence, it's thought to have been used to store corn. But more romantic archaeologists think that virgin girls intended for the gods, the Harimaguadas, lived in the caves. A 
Arucas is the third largest city of the island. Here we can find the famous church, which has become the symbol of not only the city, but the whole country, named after St. John the Baptist. The grand church with its contradictions gives reference to the height of the Gothic period. Its lancet windows, dense lines of columns, and gate giving the feeling of immense space, its projecting balconies and sculptures remind us of Notre Dame. The dark grayish lava stone, however, calls forth the other interpretation of the Gothic period, referring to the lurid, dark Middle Ages. It's a towering, lace-like, airy building resembling a haunted castle at nightfall or under thunderclouds. The square with flowers and the houses framing it, one of which is the town hall, are like a contrast to this masterpiece of the beginning of the 20th century. Las Palmas is the largest city with the biggest population of the Canary Islands, and is the seventh largest if we count the cities in Spain, too. It's a real metropolis, which at first surprises those arriving here. The southern part is the old town, separated by the Guiniguata River, while the modern city center can be found in the north. The region Triana is the commercial center of Las Palmas. We can find San Telmo Chapel here, which is the oldest church of the city. In San Telmo Square, an interesting building called Kiosco Modernista can be found. It's said to be a compressed Turkish mosque, though mosques don't have a red roof and blue walls. But the overly decorated kiosk is an ideal place for meeting. The promenade of the city, the main pedestrian zone, Calle Mayor de Triana, starts here. Here you can find any kind of shop, elegant small shops and big department stores alike. We can look at the shop windows stretching more than one kilometer, and if we get tired on the way, there are benches and cafes to have a rest. We can have an ice cream or a snack at one of the fast food restaurants, which can be found everywhere. Let's remember that Queen Isabella's decree of free trade pronounced the islands to be duty-free areas. This wasn't changed when Spain joined the European Union, so we can enjoy low prices and the comfort of paying in euro. Of course, a bank card is accepted everywhere, and though the banks are closed in the afternoon, we can get cash from banking machines day and night. There are a lot of public phones, and the rates are cheaper than in Europe. Paris Galdo's Theatre functions as an opera house and concert hall with excellent acoustics. It's the home of the oldest orchestra of Spain, Las Palmas Philharmonic. 
The building dates from 1890 with a neoclassic facade and Renaissance and Andalusian elements. The theater was named after the well-known writer who was the first representative of Spanish realism. If we cross the river, which has since dried up, we can find the real old town of Las Palmas. Its most famous building is Casa de Colón, that is Columbus House, which was the palace of the first Spanish governor of the island, Pedro de Vega. Above its entrance, the coat of arms of the Vegas can still be seen. The piquancy of the actually symmetric building is that all its doors and windows are different from each other. Wooden balcony, small trellises and folding shutters, lead glass mosaics and gothic stone frame, wrought iron grates and carved ornaments. There's a lot to admire. Christopher Columbus was born in Genoa in 1446. Before becoming a captain and discoverer, he had lived on drawing and selling sea maps. He may have heard of the Viking Leif Erikson during his first voyage, who had discovered a new world over the Pillars of Hercules. He may have had the idea here that the shortest way to India was across the Atlantic Ocean if he kept sailing towards the west. Then Columbus started looking for, as we would say today, a sponsor for his adventure. The books and films about him, for example, the famous 1492, relate in detail how he was able to gain the support of Spanish Queen Isabella. The fleet consisting of three ships left from the harbor of Palos and it took six days to get to Las Palmas. The Pinta was seriously damaged, so they spent four weeks here repairing it. During these weeks, Columbus lived in the governor's palace, which was his accommodation during his later voyages too. Today in the building, there's a museum featuring Columbus's life and voyages. We can see how he got eternal merits by his mistake. The largest place of worship in Las Palmas is St. Anne's Cathedral. Like many other churches, the three-aisle, two-belfry church was built for centuries. When construction began, the Gothic style was dominant. By the time it was finished, classical had become fashionable. The main facade is the work of the famous local artist, Lujan Perez. Opposite the cathedral, the classical palace of the town hall can be found, but it has been used as state apartments for a long time. In the square between the two buildings are life-size statues of hunting dogs. The name canary may stem from the Latin word canis, meaning dog. The colorful cube houses in the mountain are reminiscent of the architecture of the Greek islands. The Baroque palace standing behind the row of palm trees is as beautiful as a fairy tale. It's the seat of the local literary association. It used to be the building of the Theater Carrasco, which was given a new function after the Perez Galdos Theater was opened.
St. Francis Fortress was built in case attackers managed to overcome the coastal De La Luz Fortress. There was just such an invasion by the Dutch in 1599. In the middle of Doramus Park, the Santa Hotel can be found. Catalina is the most elegant hotel of the city, where there's also a casino. The so-called Canary Village was built in the park. According to Nestor de la Torre's plans, it's to show all that is beautiful or interesting in the architecture of the islands inside one group of buildings. So there are some beautifully carved wooden balconies, towers, decorated lattice, and carved stone frames. These form the edge of a cobblestone square planted with palm trees, which is at the same time the terrace of the restaurant here. At the other end of the square, in Nestor de la Torre's former house, an exhibition shows the various plans of the Canary Village and how the ideal Gran Canaria was imagined by the artist, who couldn't make his dream come true because of his early death. Conteras Beach has a favorable location due to two reasons. Firstly, it's centrally located, so if there's no danger of traffic jam, it can be reached in a few minutes from any point in the city. Secondly, a natural rock dam 200 meters from the beach protects it from strong waves. The three and a half kilometer long beach is big enough not to be crowded. Las Palomas and Playa del Inglés, which are the center of tourism and beach life of the island, used to be two separate resorts. The international airport is located between the capital and Mas Palomas, so arriving guests can reach their hotel in a short time. There's a wide range of shops and restaurants along the road to choose from. Most sport and entertainment facilities can be found here. There's a park with slides, amusement park, sport fields, hotels, and apartments. In the direction of Posito Blanco, we can find the old lighthouse, after which a hotel and two shopping centers were named.
beautiful panoramic seafront begins at San Agustin, which accompanies the entire six kilometer long sandy beach of Playa del Inglés and practically transforms itself unnoticeably into the dunes of Mas Palomas. The most unique natural formation of Gran Canaria is the 4.5 square kilometer sand desert. The sand has been blown here from the Sahara, which is 250 kilometers away. The always changing, wind-blown sand dunes give the image of a real desert. The dunes appear differently in the morning, under the midday sun, and at sunset. It's natural that people like walking here, taking photographs, sunbathing, and lying on the sand. Of course, the small desert is protected as a biosphere reservation, but in its neighborhood, more and more hotels are being built.
In Gran Canaria, tourists are attracted by several sites. Near San Agustin and Canon de Aguila, all favorable national characteristics have been taken advantage of. In the valley, a brook flows. In the cracks of the rocks, there are blooming bushes and several kinds of cactuses. This wonderful land was ideal for building a real western town. The builders of Sioux City took advantage of the situation and built a main street with a bank, church, saloon, and sheriff's office. Bisons and horses graze in corrals. Country music plays all day, and four times a day, a live show with real stuntmen is presented. In the saloon, girls dance the can-can. In the main road, outlaws fight with the sheriff, and Indians attack cowboys.
In the narrow cobblestone alleys of Aguima's old town, we can hear unusually quiet music. It's the statue of the woman with a double bass, which starts playing if somebody approaches it. The large dome of St. Sebastian Church rises above the small white houses and the squares with palm trees and flowers. On the bench of the square, an old woman with a shawl is sitting. Anybody can sit down next to her. She won't move. She sold her handmade lace tablecloths here for 70 years and became a part of the bench and the scenery of the city. After her death, local people missed her so much that they had a statue made to stand in her stead. Steep serpentine roads with hairpin curves lead up to the 2,000 meter peak of the island. We have to climb 600 to 800 meter heights near the coast. The view supplies ample compensation for us. At the most beautiful places, resting places for people traveling by car have been made. The landscape is impressive, the mountain air is fresh and clean, the sky is bright blue. The steep rocks are resplendent in various shades of yellow, brown, gray, red, and black. In the cracks of the rocks, bushes with yellow flowers flash their bright blossoms. On the lower parts, wild flowers and small palm trees grow. Above, there are evergreen bushes and pine trees, but many kinds of cactuses can also be found here. We pass small mountain villages, and soon we can see the most interesting rock, Bentaga monolith. Santa Lucia is a friendly small mountain town which is famous for the last fight between the Guanche and the Spanish. In the popular restaurant Ao, the architecture of which is interesting, the natives' tools and articles for personal use found nearby are displayed. The church also bears the name of the same saint for whom the town was named.
From the lookout tower and resting place beside the road, we can see the block of the monolith, the 84-meter Roque Nublo, balancing over the abyss. The Guanche regarded the area around such blocks of rock as a shrine. If we went on, we would soon reach the peak, Pico de las Nieves. But it isn't worth going on, as the most beautiful view waits for us in Cruz de Talleda. The village was named after the old stone cross set here. We're at 1,500 meters. In clear weather, from the terrace of the restaurant, we can see the peak of Tenerife, the highest mountain of Spain, Talleda, covered by snow all year. The sheltered bay of Puerto Rico is the training camp of the Spanish sailing team, the home of beginner and advanced surfers and sailors. It's a real water sport fishing and diving center with a big yacht harbor and 400 meter artificially made sandy beach. Anybody who longs for lonely rock bays will have to travel more than a couple of kilometers. The former bare steep rocks are full of hotels and apartments with patios. The beach built in the Valley of Torido can be used by everybody for a fee, but of course mainly the guests of the neighboring four hotels come here. The aqua park offers more services than the swimming pools of the hotels.
as in Tenerife, Laurel Park, in Gran Canaria, Palmitos Park tries to exhibit the plants of the islands, palm trees and cactuses, and mainly native animals. In the 20-hectare Palmitos Park, which was built in the gorge of Barranco de Fataga, near Mas Palomas, the focus is mainly on the botanical garden. 45 kinds of palm trees and 160 kinds of cactuses can be found here. There's a park of orchids and a butterfly farm. In the huge aquarium, 4,000 fish of 150 types swim. The view is made even more colorful by 1,200 birds. We can spend a two-week holiday full of variety, even if we don't leave the resort of Mas Palomas, Playa de la Inglés. There are so many sports and entertainment facilities that we can discover a new thing every day. Of course, not only days, but evenings offer fine entertainment for everybody. Young people can go to amusement arcades and high-tech discos. Children can enjoy amusement parks even in the evening. Adults can dance at piano bars. The shops are open until midnight, and there's always music coming from the stage. Mm -hmm.